The slave trade with the New World was started not long after the discovery of America. For more than three centuries, slave ships continued with their sinister voyages, loaded with their dreadful human cargo. Millions of people were captured in Africa and sold in America. By the end of the 18th century in Haiti alone, there was a population of more than 2,900,000 African slaves. After becoming a French possession in 1697, Haiti soon became America's biggest producer of sugar and also one of the places with the highest number of slaves in the world. Now some of the old sugar plantations have been converted into museums with enormous stills for distilling the rum, presses where the juice of the sugar cane was extracted, and raised tanks where the fruits of slave labor were kept. Slave labor carried out under the constant cracking of the whip. The living conditions of the Africans confined in these yards were atrocious. After suffering the hardships of a voyage, where normally 20% of the slaves died, they arrived at the auctions exhausted and ill. The families were separated and the individual members were sold to different settlers. Parents and children would never meet again. The overseers meted out severe punishments to those who did not work flat out, and the hunters of fugitive slaves subjected their prisoners to exemplary treatment, which often resulted in death. Many succumbed to the wounds caused by heavy shackles or dehydrated in the sun whilst changed to these sinister crosses. Cape Hachien was the point where the slavers would unload their ebony merchandise, as they called their foul-smelling load of dying slaves that survived the voyage. Today it is one of the most beautiful colonial cities of Haiti. Its houses speak loudly of the opulent past of the French settlers who managed the sugar plantations. By the end of the 18th century, the black population had reached about 3 million and there were ever-increasing problems controlling them. The blacks that escaped, known as Browns, hid in the mountains and organized themselves in very large rebel groups. The rumors about the French Revolution gave new strength to the rebels. Bukman, the leader of the Browns, organized a great secret ceremony in Bois Caiman. That night, on the 14th of August, 1791, a black pig was sacrificed and all those present drank its blood. The revolution of the slaves had begun. The message was very clear. Cut off heads, burn houses and destroy plantations. In a few days, more than a thousand whites were killed. The terrified white settlers started the legend that the blacks had made a pact with the devil that night in Bois Caiman. Many slaves were captured and executed. The brown, Macandal, was burnt alive, so becoming a legendary martyr who is still called on in voodoo ceremonies today. Toussaint Leverture became the leader of the blacks and started a rebellion that lasted for 10 years until on the 1st of January, 1804, Haiti proclaimed its independence, so becoming the first black republic in the new world. Two years later, General Henri Christophe proclaimed himself king and constructed the citadel in the north, while a mulatto, Pétion, took control of the south. The construction of this enormous fortress built to defend them from the French, who never came back, took 14 years. Each stone had to be transported by hand up to a site that was 980 meters above sea level. 20,000 people died during its construction. The story goes that Christophe ordered that those who refused to work 
should be impaled against the enormous walls of the citadel. It could house up to 10,000 people and its geographical situation made it virtually impregnable. King Christophe built up an arsenal of more than 250,000 cannonballs for the various types of cannons that he had installed in hundreds of embrasures. The citadel, the largest fortress in the Caribbean, was left anchored in the mountains as a testimony to the struggle of the Haitian people for their independence. The landscape of the north contrasts with the idea that one may have of Haiti as an arid land. In this region, where King Christophe still seems to reign, the forests are luxuriant and leafy and full of life. Christophe ordered the palace of Saint Souci to be built near the citadel in the style of Frederick II of Prussia. In 1820, at the foot of the palace stairs near the church, the eccentric king ended his own life by shooting himself with a golden bullet fired from his silver revolver. He had repressed his subjects to such a degree that they rose up against him and forced him to commit suicide. A simple monument brings him together with the other fathers of the nation at the top of a hill near Cape Haitien. The voodoo phenomenon was born during this period of struggle in spite of the colonial authorities and repression of the church. The African guards that traveled in the slaves' minds had intermingled with the Catholic doctrine of the settlers. A new religion had been born. With the flags that represented the different tribes of their ancestors, the Lacus or voodoo monasteries are spread all over the country. They are normally located in places where the slaves that had run away from the plantations hid to pray. Voodoo is a religion that is very closely linked with nature and many of its deities dwell in rivers, valleys and mountains. There are many natural settings which are real sanctuaries. The faithful retreat to these places to meditate and meet their luas, or family spirits, and the principal forces of the universe. These are spiritual observatories that enable them to communicate with the great beyond. Voodoo determines and presides over Haitian society. It is always present in a world where everything that happens, be it good or bad, is attributed to the direct intervention of the spirits. Limonade Beach is a place of pilgrimage. Preachers from the most distant parts of the country come here to perform Guinea ceremonies and beseech the favor of Azuli, Mother Earth, the goddess of love, who is identified in syncretism with the Virgin Mary. In the shade of these sacred trees, families take turns to perform their ceremonies. They mainly offer food and rum and wait for Azuli to appear for her to take possession of someone's body. In this case, the woman with the red scarf. Yeah. 
Atsuri likes to flirt and seduces people without distinguishing between sexes. She may enter the body of a man or of a woman, but everybody will immediately recognize her because of her suggestive movements. Each preacher recognizes different beings in this possession. Its syncretic translation would be the Virgin of High Grace, the Black Virgin or the Virgin of Monte Carmelo, and sometimes Saint Philomena, identified in voodoo with the siren who comes out of the sea or out of fresh water. Other participants also go into deep trances. People help them and respect them, as in these movements their souls are outside their bodies. The luas, or spirits, have taken over their bodies in order to express their wishes. During these processions, there are frequent displays of the protection conferred on them by the influence of the deity that dwells inside them. Each lua has different colors, so different colored scarves are used to call them. White carlin powder is used to attract certain deities and to identify them. Ursuli has just recognized one of her followers by the rings that adorn his hands. These are wedding rings that show that the man has married her. Each person may marry his protective lua. They gather their relations and witnesses together and go to the Onfo or Vudru temple, where a mystic wedding is held. From this moment on, the earthly spouse will have to abstain from sexual intercourse on certain days specified by his lua. For example, Edsuli prescribes Tuesdays and Thursdays, and on these days she may become before her servants in her dreams. Here in Limonat, Voodoo lives alongside the church. The devotees alternate their religious customs without any problems. From the olden days, when the settlers prohibited their African religious services, the slaves were forced to praise their gods whilst kneeling before a Catholic icon. In this way, syncretism arose and the majority of the Lua have their corresponding Christian deity or saint. Flags announce that this is a sacred place, a room where spirits dwell. This is Josephine's house. Her Lua friend revealed to her in a dream how she would paint her yard in order to favor an encounter with the spirits that live in these trees. Voodoo philosophy is very closely linked to nature and therefore has an ecological bent. Nobody dares to cut down trees as these are normally inhabited by spirits, and especially Loko, the protector of the woods. Lakus, small villages that have arisen around a temple, can be found throughout the country. A great sacred Mapu, as they call the Saibas, presides over the Laku of the Congo. The power of the Saibas comes from the belief that they can talk to the gods. Unfortunately, most of them were cut down by the French during their struggle against the slaves' revolt. The Lakus are self-sufficient population cells. Work is communal as the product obtained from the work. Each laku is run by a hugan, or voodoo priest, who is called mambo, in the case of a woman, 
and he or she is assisted by a council of elders. Its inhabitants normally have the same African roots, Congo, Ndomi, Mandingo, Ui, etc. There is a Peri style inside the temple which is dominated by the Potomitan, the pillar by which the forces that have been invoked may descend. The altar reflects once again the syncretism of this religion which was born in times of war but now keeps its machetes buried as a sign of peace. The Ungan carries out a cleansing operation that also serves as a protection against spells and he shows us the house of Shango, the lure of thunder and catastrophes equivalent to Saint Barbara. This other Lakou is Domi. Its architecture takes us to another African region from which the Yoruba deities, the Orexas, departed. The Voodoo religion acts as a bonding force for the people. It joins and fits together the range of different customs of the different ethnic groups from which the slaves that populated Haiti came. It helps to prop up a society that owes its existence to this religion. Other sacred places include the lagoons where the spirits that clean, heal and bring luck to believers live. In Plan du Nord, the people submerge themselves in the mud and make their offerings of rum. Wearing the large straw hat that characterizes the Lua Asaka, Fido Pascal, a well-known journalist and veteran of the struggle for freedom of his people against the previous regime, acts as a guide for us. Thanks to him, we were able to discover the real voodoo and avoid the countless obstacles placed in our way by the mafia that limits and sells access to this religion to foreigners. A great deal of ceremonies are performed in cemeteries among the dead. The people are not afraid of these places and it is commonplace and considered to be a great honor for someone to sleep on his father's grave. Baron Samdi, the king of the dead, can be found in all cemeteries, although in some it can only be identified by the people from the village to stop outsiders using the cemetery for their own voodoo acts. Normally, it can be recognized by its large cross and where the first burial was made. Tonight, we are witnesses to an expedition made by a Hungan from Artibonito, the region of Haiti, with the strongest magic. At the foot of the cross, the Hungan smokes a piece of paper over some candles so that the Lua Great Way allows the passage to reach Baron Samdi. Later, Kafu, who controls the crossroads between the earthly world and the great beyond, will have to give his permission. A fire is prepared with pine sticks and pieces of paper with someone's name written on it to prevent somebody leaving another person. They also use special powders made by the Hugan. In voodoo, these powders are very important. Each Hugan has his own mixtures, which range from healing powders to zombie powder. Rum and gas oil are used to warm the spirits 
which normally live in water and are always cold. The heat attracts them and the Hugan is mounted by Baron Samdi, who is equivalent to Saint Expeditious, which is why the ceremony is called an expedition. Nobody can refuse to return his violent greeting that transmits energy from the other world. This ceremony is performed so that the Baron may deliver justice in a dispute and carry out the sentence on the guilty party. The red and black dolls represent the protagonists, men and women, of the lawsuit that is presented. When this powerful Ugan is possessed, he has the power to eat glass. His lure demands it of him. Baron Samdi reigns over all the Gede, the spirits of the dead. When he mounts someone, he acts like a joker and uses obscene language. This is the lure of sexuality, and he falls in love with women. His dance imitates the cradle act, and he always smokes a lot. Once his work is finished, the Baron lies back on his tomb and prepares to leave the body that he has possessed. The Hugan is shocked when the Baron leaves. He does not know how he got there. He can remember nothing. In Bere, an old lady has died and a funeral party has been announced, which will last all night. With songs, the young people trying to cheer up her son who sits at a small table looking at photos of his dead mother. The whole village attends the party. It is a social duty to attend the dead from the moment that death occurs. At the back of the house, the women make coffee so that the people can make it through the night and the party may be successful. They have a totally different view of death from the Christians. The cycle is renewed and death is the end of the journey through life. Now the soul of the deceased will walk towards the past to meet up with his ancestors. Next day, the people attend the burial dressed up in their finest clothes. <laughs> Scenes of grief continue. It is necessary to shout a lot so that the dead person knows that he is dead. The soul does not leave the body immediately, instead it remains at his side, and it is necessary to convince it to go off with the Gede, 
otherwise it could disturb the living. In some places they turn the coffin over many times so that the dead person gets lost and cannot find his way home. In the center of Port-au-Prince, the capital of Haiti, we find the presidential palace where the bloodthirsty dictators François Duvalier, Papa Doc and his son Baby Doc lived. Opposite the front of the palace is the statue of the slave Toisson Louverture who led the fight against the French. On the other side, the figure of a slave blowing a lambi, symbol of the fall of colonial power and the fight against the oppression of slavery. It is the Gallery of Art Naïf. The Church of the Trinity is the first that opened its doors to this type of artwork. The art of a people who feel a need to express themselves by painting in this way. Haiti is the country of color. The people paint their houses, their streets, and their collectively owned cars, the famous tap-taps. The Haitian people have suffered countless attacks and their freedom has been repressed on many occasions. Perhaps the most tragic example, because it was so recent, was that carried out by the Duvalier dictators and their reigns of terror sustained by witchcraft and black magic. They were surrounded by their troops, the Tom Tom Makuts, most of whom were Boko, wizards that work on the dark side of voodoo, the Deme, which means with both hands. This practice is the opposite of Guinea, in which the Hugan only uses his right hand. The Catholic Church does not like to coexist with voodoo, while the voodooists, on the contrary, have no trouble of coexisting with the church. On one side of the cathedral, people can be found praying and asking for help before a figure of Christ that occupies an important place in their beliefs. Rituals are celebrated daily in the cemeteries of Port-au-Prince. The dead must be well attended to, otherwise they will bother you instead of helping you. We attend a mass with Philo Pascal that is being held for a dead relative before Baron Samdi. He has offered food and rum which the end will be shared out among the poor people who come to the cemeteries because of this. A year and day after the death, the family members must release the soul of the deceased which has been living up to until now in the water. They must carry out a very expensive ceremony in which an ox is sacrificed. If they delayed for a long time, the deceased may rise up against them. In the traditional voodoo law, the maximum penalty is zombification and not death. The Huguns that have passed sentence will appoint an executioner who will blow the zombie powder in such a way that the criminal will inhale it without realizing it. Shortly afterwards, he will die without anyone knowing why, and he will be buried. Sometime later, he will be exhumed, an antidote will be applied, and they will steal his soul. He will obey the Huguns and will work for the rest of his life for them. In fact, they reduce him to a cataleptic state produced by tetrodotoxin, the main ingredient of the zombie powder. His brain does not receive sufficient supply of blood, which combined with the shock of being buried alive causes irreversible damage to his mental faculties. But those who work the Deme may also use these sinister techniques for revenge. For this reason, there are some people who poison their dead before burying them because they could have been victims of a boko and be turned into zombies.
The most important secret societies were born a long time ago and were the real spiritual support for the uprising of the slaves. Their ceremonies, like this one of Bosu, are more violent because they call upon the Lua Petro, originally from Haiti. The voodooists inhale some powder made up by the Huguns which stimulate the senses and keep them awake all night long. From this moment on, the atmosphere gets hotter and hotter until a climax is reached where almost everyone suffers severe trances. The Lua Petro have arrived. The slave ships also arrived in Cuba, thereby creating another large African population. Here, the rebel slaves were called Cimarrones, and they also had to win their freedom. Their dominant beliefs were Yoruba, which, when syncretized, created what is known today as Regla de Ocha, a religion which, to a greater or lesser degree, is practiced by most of the population. All the rituals of the Regla de Ocha start with the smoking of herbs such as basil or siempre viva, everlasting flower. Apart from the purification of the participants, the spirits of plants, animals and men must always be present in the Regla de Ocha. They wear white and worship the same deities as in the Haitian voodoo. Olga holds the chicken which they are going to sacrifice to Exu. The Babalawo that she went to see consulted the oracle to Ifa and he told her what to do she had run the risk of being deceived by a man. The man officiating the ceremony throws the coconuts. Depending on whether they fall face up or face down, he will know if Echo, who controls creation and is very close to Olofi, the Legla de Ocha god, allows the sacrifice. Later, he gets the whole congregation to take part. In this way, although it is he who carries out the sacrifice, it will be everyone's responsibility. Hey, hey, hey. 
Guarani Moro. El Guarabara su guayo mama queña. The flowing of body fluids substitutes human life. Life is given in order to preserve life and establish a unifying link with the supernatural order. On these altars we can see the African gods Okun, the warrior. Sango, the erection of thunder and lightning, or Saint Barbara in syncretism. The god of ancestors. Orula, intermediary of Olofi, the sun, and above this, Obataya, the lord of the mines, equivalent to Our Lady of Mercy. And lastly, Saint Lazarus, the saint of epidemics and diseases. Before consulting the Ifa, the oracle around which the Regla de Ocha revolves, they call upon Orula that comes from the sun. Here the ceremonies are held in houses. With the lack of houses that exist in Cuba, a temple would be a luxury. They drink the rara ekuo, a soft drink made from corn which protects them from the heat which comes down from heaven through the spirit Orula. Using a red cloth and a crate, the great spirit is trapped while a consultation is taking place. The Yoruba Ifa uses a very complicated prophecy technique. More than a thousand deities may appear in the form of mathematical combinations. The Babalawua must interpret them correctly and identify the final answer to the consultation, which will be the decision and order of Orula. The person officiating the ceremony shakes the seeds and marks one or two lines of different length depending on the number of seeds that are left in his left hand. When a ruler appears, all get down on their knees. Now the oracle can be consulted. <laughs> Jacinto is a member of the Auwaka Secret Society and today is undergoing initiation ceremony in the Palo de Monte, Cuban black magic. The essential difference between the Regla de Ocha and El Palo is that here they work with the dead instead of with the saints. This religion is based on the Prenda Mayombe, the pots where they catch the dead in order to use them in rituals. If the offering has crosses, it is to do good. If it does not have any, it is for black magic. It will be covered with black cloths and will be called Prenda Judia, or Jewish offering. They use sticks from different woods, stones, human bones, tools, coconuts, 
and a dead man's skull. Once they have finished preparing the prenda, Jacinto is led to the altar. The songs announce the action they are performing. They are clear and repetitive in order to guide the prenda and so guarantee that the ceremony is successful. Jacinto is subjected to arduous tests, with his eyes blindfolded and without knowing which new trial he'll be forced to undergo, he starts to get upset. No prospective member of the society knows in advance what will happen in the initiation ceremony. They only know that it is hard and that not all of them can endure it till the end. He soon feels faint. His knees are stiff and tremble with excitement. He needs a rest. The uncertainty makes him lose control of his nerves. His fellows encourage him, but they urge him to stand firm, saying, This is a sacrifice, but you must suffer for the Brenda. The officiant scratches him. With a knife, he carves into his skin the identifying marks of the seven rays, the spirit sango for the worshippers of the Regla de Ocha. The candidate is exhausted, but the worst is over. Now he only has to receive blessings. After five hours in a blindfold, Jacinto's eyes have to get used to the light again. The officiant instructs him to stick out his tongue, pressing a lighted candle to his mouth while repeating the principles of the religion. It will give him strength, light, agility, and stability. Once the initiation is over, the prenda's mayombe must be fed, so a goat and two hens are sacrificed. Their blood will satisfy the appetite of the dead, who will help the newly initiated member to follow the way of Palomonte.
drink from the goat's head. Take it as if it were ours, and allow us to go on living. The Regla de Ocha worshippers also worship Olorum, the sea siren that lives in the depths. They make offerings of fruit and flowers and ask her to accept the actions on which they will wish to embark and to help them overcome hardships. She's a friendly goddess who is always nearby. Brazil was the other place where a large number of slaves arrived during the time of the slave trade. It is estimated that there was a population of almost 9 million black Africans at the end of the 18th century. Here too, syncretic religions and cults such as Condomble, Macumba and Umbanda developed. Whites and blacks both practice these religions which have developed at the same time as members of the highest social classes became followers. Umbanda is based on the worship of the Agun, beings with great spiritual light, strength and wisdom. Their objective is to attract these beneficial spirits so as to do good. Here, drums and rhythm play a fundamental role. Each spirit has its own beat and its own cadence. Their altars are dedicated to the same deities as in Voodoo and Rega de Ocha, Exu, Ogun the warrior, Le Mania the siren, Obatala, the creator, Sango, and the rest of the African pantheon. The Pai de Santo, the Umbanda priest, draws the symbol of Exu on the ground. This is the lord of the ways, the ancestral Pai, the intermediary between men and spirits. He is compared with Saint Peter in syncretism. This is a joker of a spirit that drinks and smokes a lot, but who is beneficial and loves children. Here the dark world of black magic exists too. Vodum fetishes from Daomi which may exercise a sinister influence in a secret place. Umbanda temples like this one in Rio de Janeiro with hundreds of thousands of worshippers. Some of them have sports fields and other activities and perform an important social function with orphanages, shelters and aid for poor districts. This is the evolution of a religion as old as man himself, which over time has been cleansed and become more sophisticated but which maintains its purest spiritual concepts. Periodically, the followers meet and perform sessions where our now familiar African deities descend to transmit their messages. The trances are not as sharp as in other religions, but they all encounter their friendly saint. Everything started one night in Africa when a black man sacrificed a hen and he offered it to the spirits that he saw in the stars, guards that traveled as slaves 
and helped their faithful followers to gain their freedom. Perhaps everything that we have seen is not real. Perhaps spirits do not exist and do not live so closely alongside the living. In the West, it is hard for us to believe in these religions, but bearing in mind that millions of human beings can feel these forces and are able to interpret them, it is worth our while to ask ourselves the question and allow ourselves to doubt.